OK, so let's start with the, what would be like the regular lectures. This first lecture, it's just a, a reminder, OK? So as, uh, as I said, we are assuming that all of you know about deep learning. But maybe you took one of our course in autumn, and which ended in January. And since then, you haven't looked at it anymore. So this should be helpful for you just to refresh what, what are these keywords and names that we are going to be using throughout this course, OK? Um, this lecture is called the Neural Network, Network Zoo because it kind of follows uh, this sheet from uh, this researcher, Fyodor Van Fen, who released this sheet with just uh, many different uh, neural networks architecture. So I'll try to follow kind of his notation and his ideas, OK? Just combined with some other references and, and links. So just, so let's get ready for 15, 20 minutes of very, so what, what are deep neural networks? Super quickly. So here you have like the most simple neural network you can think about, where there's uh, an input uh, which has like two components, x, y, and x2. And like the perceptron, which will be the name of, of this uh, very, si very, very simple neuron, has two parameters, three parameters, uh, one weight, w1, uh, weight, w2, and a bias, b, right? And if, if you, if we know these parameters and we know the, the input values, we can compute the output of, of this perceptron. Yeah. So and always, like when we train neural networks, we have a huge amount of these perceptrons. And what we are trying to do is estimate uh, these weights and bias. That's that's our goal. That when we train neural networks, that's what we are trying to do. So of course, with only one perceptron, uh, there isn't much that you can do uh, in terms of. Uh, estimating a, a function. In the end, uh, neural networks, they are function estimators. Okay? So they are super powerful, but they are function estimators. That's, that's all they are, they are doing. So with only one perception, you cannot do much. But what you could do is you could have um, more than one perception. And then things become more and more interesting. So for example, this perception, uh, these two uh, perceptions, they, they allow to uh, model the x nor function, which is nonlinear, so just combining two of them with the right parameters, you can uh, estimate or, or, or implement more complex functions by combining different uh, perceptions. In this case, there are only like two layers of perceptions. But if you, instead of just uh, having two layers, have many layers, or typically more than two, uh, then it's when you, we start talking about deep neural networks. It means that we have many, many, many perceptions structuring layers, and we have many of these layers. And that's where the deep comes from, OK? The, the, neur the neural comes from the perceptron, which is kind of a simulation of how, or an, it's, it's a, a tool that's been inspired by how human neurons work, OK? And then when you have many of them connected, that's a network. And when you have many layers, that's deep. What if, uh, instead of just having one input that goes straight which goes fed straight into the output. What if we allow the memory just to, to have some uh, internal loop? Like we allow the memory to, to remember what it has seen in the past. When, when we uh, provide a memory uh, tool, or one of, one of the simplest ways to provide a memory to a neural network, it's just to create a new connection that connects uh, each neuron with itself, but for the next time step. So in this case, it, that's when the input is not just one uh, x at time, at only one x, but we have like a sequence of inputs, like one x at time step t, t plus one, t plus two. And if you want, if you allow the network to remember what was the what's called the hidden state uh, in the previous step, time step, that's when we have recurrent neural networks. Yeah, that's the basic idea of recurrent neural networks is that you have memory. You remember what, what you have seen in the past very, very quickly. That's the basic idea. If you try to implement that, if you just go, OK, that's a great idea. I'm going to implement it. I'm going to train my network. You'll see that that's very unstable. And it's really hard to train a network like this. So there have been um, solutions like uh, long short-term memory or gated recurrent units, which, is, which are the most popular solutions that allow to implement this concept of memory, OK, which actually it's they are a bit more complex than just one 
hidden connection that, that fits back to itself. It's a, there are some gates in there, which makes things more complex. But in the end, they are just practical implementations of recurrent neural networks. Yeah? So when we say, talk about LSTM or GRU, these are words that will pop up during the course, we are talking about implementations of recurrent neural networks that you can actually, in practice, train. Okay? So all these deep learning frameworks, they have these, these uh, layers and, and, and tools um, implemented. Then another type of layers are the convolutional uh, layers in a deep neural network. Okay? The basic idea of convolutional neural networks is that um, if a basic uh, neuron would, would connect to all the neurons from the previous layer, that would be like a classical multilayer perception, the idea of convolution is that we don't do this anymore, but we just connect to, to a, a, a local neighborhood of the previous layer. That's, that's the idea of convolution, okay? And then as we connect that, what we need to do is we need to move our filter so that it scans all the previous layer. So actually what we have is we have a convolutional filters that we, uh, that scan, that uh, sweep the previous uh, layer. So then the output is not just one single output, but we have an output for each possible location, okay? So I'm trying, I'm making this explanation very, very generic because it is true that convolutional networks have been broadly used in vision and maybe that's where they become more popular, right? So th you see here that's Lenet5, that's this network from Jan LeCun from 1998 where he managed to, thanks to these local filters, these local convolutions, he managed to train a neural network to solve a challenging computer vision task which was handwritten uh, digit recognition. Okay, that's how they did it. He, he did thanks to these uh, commercial net uh, filters that, that scan the input image, or if you are here, it's going to scan all the previous output uh, activation layers. Um, but keep into account that you, ca you could also uh, apply convolutions on sequences of, of data sequences. So typically, it's, it's, it has been very successful when applied for um, speech, for example, for uh, speech synthesis nowadays, like there's a very popular model called WaveNet that actually it's based on this principle, right? And even if speech, you can think that, okay, it's a sequence, and then when, when we think about sequences, we tend to say, oh, sequence, recurrent neural networks, which maybe historically has been the, the case, you can also uh, apply convolutions on sequences. It's just a, a local neighborhood, and you can, uh, you can apply a local neighborhood on a, on a sequence. It doesn't have to be a 2D uh, input lay, uh, data to do that, okay? So in this, in this course, like convolutions will be mostly 2D, so the classic ones that most people have heard about. You will see in video that you can also have like 3D convolutions that they take into account time. And I'm not sure if you will see in any lecture any 1D convolution. I cannot remember now, but it's, it's possible, okay? Just to, that if, if you ever deal with natural language processing or speech, just be aware that there can be 1D, 1D convolutions as well. It's not, nothing specific for vision, even if, if it has become popular from this, from this part. So Jan Lecun proposed that for uh, this digital recognition and then everything became much more uh, popular and interesting when that was used to solve uh, a, a very challenging image classification task called ImageNet that Kevin will cover just uh, after this lecture. Then the same way as there are like convolutional networks. Normally convolutional networks, what they have is they have these convolutional filters, which is the, what makes them special, but together with other layers, like uh, typically there are like uh, max poolings, there are like relus, probably, like nonlinear activations, but also there are some other uh, layers that, uh, that, so just go back here. Typically convolutional uh, neural networks, they have these max pooling um, operators that they just decrease the spatial extent of the feature map. So the deeper you go, in, in many cases, not always, but in many cases, you have, uh, let's say, s smaller feature maps in, in terms of, of special coordinates. That's what typically happens when you have the classic convolutional neural networks. And then in many cases, uh, you want uh, to run applications where the output is not just uh, uh, just tell me if that's an orange or not, but the output of your neural network, it's Again, an image, and typically an image of, with the same dimensions of the input. 
right? So you have an image as input, and you want some type of image at the output. Yeah, in this case, this output is a silency map. It's, sal it's a silency map. It just predicts where people are going to look from this image. But the dimension of this one is the same as this one, right? And if you just apply pooling uh, operations here, uh, the spatial extent, when you reach this point, it's much smaller. So if you want to recover, there are some tricks, but one of the th tricks that makes more sense is to use uh, some deconvolutional operations, and there are like some vari variety there as well. And so there are, again, there are filters that apart from estimating the parameters, they, ask, they somehow expand the spatial extent of the feature map, okay? That also exists, and you will see that during the lectures, that there are many models that do that, okay? So when you see struct architecture like this, it's not a mistake, it's, it's fine. You can, you can train filters that make your feature maps larger in the spatial extent. That's the message. There is also uh, this concept of residual connections. That's when you allow the, your, both your data, when you go feed forward to the network, or the gradients where you are backpropagating, to skip some layers. Okay? That's the idea of the residual uh, connections. Yeah? And this has shown that it helps in performance in many applications. Let's leave it like this. But when we talk about resi residual connections, that's what we are uh, dealing with. Um, these are, so there's one network called UNET, so Resilient Connections was used to improve, Kevin will talk about this, uh, to improve results on ImageNet, image classification, but it has also been used for other applications like image segmentation to, let's say, to, to keep the details, to keep the small edges that you detect in the first layers, to be able to preserve them at, at the output. Because otherwise, when you go, if you just, if you just had this path, you, the small details, the, all the edges, they kind of disappear, and, you can, and from here it's, it's not possible to recover them. So sometimes what you do is you just uh, copy the feature maps you have here, you copy them uh, in a deeper layer, and then you take it from there. Yeah, you'll see many architectures like this, especially in the segmentation part. Uh, skip connections have also been used for um, speech. That's actually WaveNet that I uh, mentioned earlier, where at some point you just in this case, this version just goes uh, directly to the output. There's also dense layer uh, where you, what you have is you connect everything. All layers are connected, and that's called uh, dense net. And that's another uh, type of architectures which uh, they have shown some improvement, uh, but also at the cost of more parameters. Because the more connections, the more parameters. So every connection has a filter there that you need to train and estimate. But when we talk about dense connection, that's what it means, okay? okay. Then, other, w other words I'd like you to be aware, uh, autoencoder, okay? Autoencoder is a, is an architecture that where the, the task that it has to solve is just to reconstruct at the output the same that you have at the input, yeah? So that's the task is just, I want to have at the output the same data I had at the input. Um, in, if you, you can, you, we can define these architectures. We don't need any labels to train that. So that's a basic architecture for uh, unsupervised learning, the, probably the most basic one. Okay? Um, you have never uh, heard uh, about this unsupervised learning. This can be interesting, for example, to uh, use these features as, so use this uh, architecture to generate features that of any dimension that we want, which might, might be uh, compacting the information at the input. So that's one of the applications you could have done. And also another application that you will see quite a lot in this, in this course is uh, typically what you have is you have a layers data set with just a few labels. So just, just a few where just few of the samples are labeled, but you have many, 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 many samples that are not labeled. So one thing you can do just that the network gets uh, familiar with the statistics of your data. You can train an autoencoder or many other architectures and then uh, that's how you would, uh, you have your data, you encode it, you have your hidden state, and now you decode it just to reconstruct what you had at the input. Yeah, For, to do that you don't need any, any labels. Then you train this, especially the encoder, and then finally what you do is you fine tune, so you remove the decoder and you train some layers on top, a classifier let's say, if you want to classify images, but, but uh, taking advantage of the weights and parameters you already learned at the encoder. 
So by doing that, you can uh, make uh, better, so just with few labels, you, you might be able to just estimate the parameters for this part, taking advantage of the parameters you already trained here, that already know some of the statistics of your data. Okay, so that's one of the tricks when you have lots of data and just few labels. Some, some uh, modifications of the autoencoder is when we have an in, the encoder and decoder, but the hidden representation in the middle, we force it to follow some statistics. For example, we fo typically we force it to follow a Gaussian distribution, and there are tricks to do that. If we do that, later we can, uh, so we train the network, and later we remove the encoder, we remove this, and then what we can do is we generate uh, samples. We generate samples from a Gaussian distribution, feed them here, and that will generate new data. This is a generative model. This is a model to generate new data. An architecture that is very popular are adversarial networks. Maybe you've heard them like GANs, where actually you don't have one network, but you have two. You have one network that will generate uh, data samples from your distribution, let's say images of uh, faces in this case, and you have another network that will try to distinguish between the image of the face that was generated by the generator with respect with images of faces that were real, okay? If you train at the same time a generator that is supposed to generate very realistic faces and the discriminator that is supposed to distinguish between the synthetic faces produced by the generator and the real faces that you have from your data set, if you are managed to train this at the same time, in the end, typically what we do is we, we keep the generator and with the generator we can generate new faces or new images or new whatever, which look realistic to, to a, at least a human eye. Yeah, that's uh, the adversarial networks or, or GANs. More uh, advanced uh, models, what they do is they really try to train uh, networks that they kind of mimic how a computer works. So they have like a, a, a memory module where you can write and read, okay? This, the, one of the most popular ones is called the differenti differentiable neural computers, which is kind of uh, inspired with uh, the model of a von Neumann architecture, which is a classic one in computer science. And, and recently there are many uh, uh, there's a research line in, in, in this field. Uh, recently has been pr proposed this MAC network that kind of follows the, the same idea of having some control that allows to read and write from a memory. Okay, this quite highly experimental. It's very tricky to train these models, but that's one of the direction architectures that uh, maybe someday we see uh, more deployed. Uh, I have seen this working uh, for to solve problems like um, visual reasoning. So visual re reasoning, it kind of it has been so far, it has been used to, uh, I don't know if you see the image, but to answer questions that, that require some reasoning about the image. Okay, so you make a question about an image, but to answer that you need to reason a little bit. So questions like, let me read. Uh, okay, the question is, what is the material of the large object that is both behind the big yellow object and in front of the blue cylinder? Okay, so in order to answer this question and you have this image, you, you need to go and identify like the different objects that you have there and reason about it. It's not that obvious. It's not like um, you see. I think you see application of visual questions like uh, I don't know how many cats are there in the image. Okay, that's that seems like a more challenging question. So in order to solve these questions, people are proposing these these models with some memory in control. Okay, and that was the overview view I want you to present to you of words that will come in the next lectures. Um, if you want to read the second part, I will not cover it, but he has a second blog post, so this author called The Network, the Neural Network Zoo Prequel, Cells a Layer, where it kind of goes deeper into the type of cells and layers that compose these large architectures that I, that I reviewed today. Yeah, and that will be it for this first introductory lecture.